Good day and welcome to another edition of Insight. Today we really want to get an insight into the opposition People's National Party and no better person to have than its chairman. He's also a member of parliament and we want to know if he, what's his ambition there? To continue? To one day ascend to the top of the pile or what? But we have some other issues going on. Um, only this morning um, we wake up to an editorial to ask if he has gone rogue. I personally heard him on a recent commentary that the People's National Party will win the next election. So he's assured of that and uh, therefore we want to know what is causing that, that assurance and what is it that. But let's start out with the party for which he's chairman. How has the party since conference, since the scathing comments that attended the presidential elections, things settling down, um, where is it in terms of um, being on the table? Good morning, Michael, and good morning to your many listeners, or good day, depending <laughs> on where in the world yes. they might be looking. Pleasure for being with you and to share my thoughts on the subjects that you may raise. Yes, we had a very competitive internal election for the presidency in September. And um, like all internal elections, I've witnessed you know, a few yeah. in my time. Um, you're going to have disappointed comrades, and you're going to have jubilant comrades. And as is the case, there's a period, a cool enough period, when you know, temper will settle and you know, exuberance will settle. And the full appreciation of the fact that we all belong to one party and we have a common goal and we have to focus on that. Indeed, some utterances were made during on both sides. They were unfortunate. We tried. I chair the internal oversight committee for that election. And we tried our best to, to ensure that good sense prevail on the part of the different comrades um, active in the campaign. I must concede we're not as successful as we would have wanted. But be that as it may, we are where we are. What I'm very pleased about is the recognition of the fact that we, have one, we are one party and we have an election to win. Um, I have met with Comrade Mountain myself in my capacity as chairman and the general secretary, and we have set certain mechanisms in place. The party president has reached out to Comrade Bunting and others who supported him. Him, um, Comrade Phillips himself, have been through this before, <laughs> and he knows very well what their feeling and, 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 and state of mind would be after a defeat. And um, he, have, he has had um, successful dialogue with members of the party and the team who did not support him. And I think we're in a much better place than we were immediately after the election in September. Are we where we want to be? Certainly not. And for that reason, we have more work to do. For example, this Friday, Comrade Phillips in part of the Do Road um, program will be in Comrade Dayton Campbell's constituency, as we will do in all the constituency, regardless of who supported who, because all are a part of the team that is going to help and ensure that the People's National Party forms the next government whenever the next election is, is called. So in summary, we are, we are at a much better place now than we were two months ago, and great strides have been made towards that end. You alluded to the many instances you have seen this occurred, where there's a presidential thing and scathing and um, schisms form. Um, but ever, hitherto, for, we have never had it social media type of uh, context. I, and um, alas, I still see and I still hear people smarting yes. from and, and not wanting and to know, be a part of it. You know, that's one of the reasons why we said at the very outset, be careful what you say, because you can set a spark out that cause an uncontrollable fire, and you have this multiplier effect. Many out there who are saying many things are not necessarily members of the People's National Party. There are many out there in social media using pseudo pseudonyms and commenting. But again, Michael, we, I, Comrade Phillips, and many of us, we understand and we know what it's, it's like. Um, I have had to try to tame 
some of the persons who supported the losing candidate in the past. So I know what it is like. I've seen it before. But I'm still confident and hopeful that those comrades and supporters who are still snarting will settle down, but, and I hope sooner than later. To what extent um, this is an Achilles heel, if you may, going into a major elections, which they, they're, they're warming up on the tracks. The, the, the Prime Minister has literally said, get warm up, do your thing, um, you, you'll be brought on the right track so to get on the orders. So. You, know, you know, Michael, the downside of being in opposition is that you don't call the election. It's the incumbent government that has that gift. Um, and so as, a, as, a, as an opposition party, and Comrade Phillips has made the point repeatedly to us in the party, the only response we can have is to be well prepared as early as possible. And we had started that process for over um, two years now since the leadership change in, in March 2017. We can say all of the what we identify as critical seats, the candidates are in place in all of those constituencies. And there are a few remaining ones, which we'll consider the more challenging ones for the People's National Party. We have taken a decision at the last NEC that that list will be completed by the 18th of this month. So before the year end, we'll have in place all 63 candidates ready for the election. But that is one phase of it. Mm -hmm. Getting the organization revved up in each constituency is critical. And we make the point, we don't win to form the next government by one vote. We win to form the next government by winning constituency by constituency. So yours truly, as you indicated at the outset, I intend to win the next election in South St. Catherine. And I will continue to do all that has caused, <laughs> all that is necessary to win, as I have done in the past. Yeah. And I have not lost faith with my constituents who continue to have trust and confidence with me to serve them yes. and represent Jamaica well. And I'll continue to do that with the confidence that they will not only re-elect me, yes. but fellow People's National Party candidates, so that we can continue the recovery of Jamaica. Winning is not just a matter for the, or a desire for People's National Party. It is to continue fulfilling our historic committed role of building a better Jamaica for the people of Jamaica. In 2011, 2012, when we formed the government, we rescued a, a, an economy that, mm -hmm. economy that was, was on the precipice of collapse. And it's become a fact. Even to the credit of this government, they have acknowledged that is the recovery work led by Peter Phillips as Minister of Finance, that have, is causing Jamaica to breed a sense of relief, one, and be able to pursue some of those critical things. Regrettably, I think the government has squandered the opportunities that that recovery has provided in terms of how they used, utilize the fiscal space. Um, and we intend to return to government to demonstrate the kind of managerial leadership under the leadership, political leadership of Comrade Phillips to, to ensure that we have growth in the economy, um, ensure that our children are properly educated and educated in a relevant way to deal with the new economy mm -hmm. that we are a part of. We have to ensure that the ordinary Jamaican can, can, can get up with confidence that if they have a health challenge, they can go to the public facilities with certain amount of confidence that they could be, can be reasonably treated in a modern world. We are going to make sure that most of all, Jamaica is a safer place than it is. And I know you might want to talk about the whole national security situation. Oh, yes. Which so, is, oh, yes. Which we is couldn't. A, which is we a, couldn't. Boy, I, I, I'm not going to take that on yet because I'm going to segment this thing. I want to deal with the party. I want to deal with the, the preparedness. Yes. yes and the readiness of it, and uh, want to ensure that uh, those outside who support you want to understand where their party is in terms of uh, an engine. Is it fine-tuned? Well, is it ready to go, or does it need more fine-tuning? We lost the 2016 election that we shouldn't have lost, and much lessons have been learned from that exercise. We have won from being in opposition to becoming government, right? We're not accustomed, unaccustomed to taking on challenge and come out victorious. We have done it before, 
and we are going to do it again. I'm going to ask you to hold that thought because we're going to take a break as we have to do it now and then do it again. But right now we take a break from inside. Welcome back to Insight. Fitz Jackson is with us. He's a member of the opposition. He didn't walk out. He's still here. Why did the opposition walk out? It, oh. was, very, it was very unfortunate what transpired yesterday. We have a standing order, which you know is equivalent to the guidebook for the conduct in Parliament. Um, the, the House leader, um, Mr. Samuda, was also the um, Minister Active with Minister responsibility for education. for education was answering a set of questions from the opposition shadow minister for education, Mr. Peter Bunting. And um, Mr. Bunting alluded to a letter that was written by senior staff members of the Edna Manley um, College setting out a set of complaints for which he he, he drew to the attention of Mr. Samuda. Mr. Samuda responded to ascribe what is being referred to in the letter as mere sus and not a formal set of complaint. And of course, we insisted for him to, to withdraw that comment because he was ascribing improper motives to the member from Central Manchester, Mr. Bunting. The leader of the opposition rose in support of the need for the speaker to have the member, Mr. Samuda, apologize and withdraw the statement. To make matters worse, Mr. Samuda got up and said, no one will let him withdraw or apologize for that statement. No he one? Made. No one. No, not even the speaker? <laughs> <laughs> By invitation. Yes, yes. And, and he then went on to cast a serious aspersion to, on the entire opposition that we are hell-bent on overthrowing the government. Now, that's a criminal act. He said that in open parliament. We call upon the speaker to exert his authority as the final referee in the parliament. And he failed. In that situation, how could we remain? But so on that basis, we all left. But subsequently, Important. my understanding is that you will not return until. Do not put you in a... No, we did not say we will not return until. That sitting for which Mr. Samuda made that scurrilous remark against the member from Central Manchester and the entire opposition, we could not sit through that sitting. And we will treat each sitting as a new one. We have asked for an apology. Uh, we expect it to come. Not just for our return, but to demonstrate to the Jamaican people that good sense can prevail in its parliament. And I'm calling on the Prime Minister, who is who's ultimately the head of the government, and, and who seeks to ensure the appointment of, who appointed the House leader, to act in this instance and have his member do the apology and withdraw the statement he made in the last sitting. It's the most honorable, it's the least that we, he, he could do. And if he doesn't? We'll consider our next move. Um, what are the possible moves? It's many, but we will, we have time to decide. The parliament won't sit again until next Tuesday. So between now and then, we'll come up with um, an appropriate response, if there's no apology up to then. Well, if he's adamant that I won't and no one can, do, I mean, as a former comrade himself, do you expect him to... Because uh, he crossed the floor, didn't he? I'm he crossed the floor, he broke some fingers. Yes, I was And he that. declared that the GL GLP was made up of lackeys and yes men, mm -hmm. which he rejoined. I yes. don't know if he rejoined to become one of. Yes. Um, but he will say that is in his past. We are more concerned about his present and his conduct in our parliament now. You see, you see, we're in a little difficult situation. As an opposition, we have a responsibility to the people of Jamaica. And where the prime minister and members of his team become derelict in their responsibilities, in their behavior, and in their conduct, 
it's incumbent on us not to join them and to remain committed to that responsibility we have to the people of Jamaica. And so the action we take on Tuesday will be very much influenced by that responsibility, which we are quite con cognizant of. Yes. Have you gone rogue? One of the daily newspapers, let me be, you know, be sure that I'm the observer, in an editorial, has said you seem to be out there speaking on your own. You don't come under any kind of, um, you know, whip. Um, you know, people keep you in check to speak as one. You, 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 you're calling for all kind of big money for police, knowing that the budget is what it is, and, it, and for somebody who usually work with the Ministry of Finance. Um, you, 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 it is you. because of that experience I had in the Ministry of Finance where I could make that kind of statement in calling for some compassionate one-off payment for the police. And let me say up front, it's not the first time. I presided over two MOUs in my tenure over a five-year period, and I worked closely with the subsidy government. We have made one-off payments before throughout singular group and across the public service from time to time when the circumstance demanded. There is some vague um, reference to service-wide implication. That was a very reckless comment. I know what service things that can cause service-wide implication. And as I said, we have done similar payments before. It is out of that knowledge that I could have made the statement that we made. Now, the case in point, those voices that is claiming that I become rogue in standing up for good sense, where were those voices when you had the, the, the blatant acts of corruption throughout the government service where billions of dollars of taxpayers' money has been, been, been lost or misspent in debushing program where grass never grow, you have payments being made for debushing. De, 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 de you have the, the, the Petrojam former HR manager being paid over 30 odd million dollars for virtually no service. You have the dismissal of this um, CF, um, chief financial officer at Petrojam sent on guard leave and paid over a million dollars per month after. 13 months and had to be returned to the work because of improper dismissal. We have about the millions of dollars in the Universal Access Fund. We know about the millions of dollars in Nestle. We know about the millions of dollars in CMU, the millions of dollars in the Ministry of Education of taxpayers' money for which the people of Jamaica have not benefited, benefited. and to pay just over a billion dollars to the police in a most trying circumstance towards security of our people, that is being, ro being um, term gone wrong. Well, if that, if to defend the police and to defend the security of, uh, security of our people is making me rogue, then I'm a guilty rogue. A curry favoring there is suggesting, you know, um, brown nosing. As I said, you know, I wonder where those voices were when Audley Shaw promised the nurses 50% increase on their salary. That is a service-wide um, pronouncement, a service-wide implication with a recurring effect. A one-off payment does not have a recurring effect. It is just what it says, a one-off liability. Yeah. So you deal with it now, you don't have to deal with it next year. No. Look, look, Michael, the most pressing problem facing the Jamaican people, every single Jamaican, whether you're black, white, rich, poor, rural, urban, your the security is the number one issue facing all of us. The data shows that our economic growth is impaired by our security challenges. Uh, and you're going to tell me that an investment of a billion dollars are just over that to, 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 to assist the men and women on the front line who are working 40 and 60 hours a week. They are exhausted. They are burnt out. And because of that situation, their, their, their optimal performance is compromised. Policemen come to me and tell me that they are disappointed that they are not able to do what they are trained to do because they are burnt out. And those persons writing those articles and those who are joining them in the comments are going to tell me that a billion dollars is too much on a one-off basis. I know how it. inconsiderate and I, insincere I those notice, persons are. I notice with interest that there is a certain bill being debated in the House, you might have some interest in the Bank of Jamaica Act. 
There is, there is, there is a one being, be, no, not being debated. There is a joint select yes, of the Banking Services Act, but is not to deal with the banking fees. Okay. Now, I have retabled the banking fee bill, which is an amendment to the Banking Services Act, so that the ordinary, very ordinary, not so ordinary, every single Jamaican who have a bank account, is not penalized unjustifiably, unreasonably, and I dare to say in one instance, criminally, by the banking system because they, they deduct these fees from their accounts, amounting to over $50 billion yes. of extra revenues at no risk. Where does it go now? You have retabled it? I have retabled it. Yeah. I have appealed to the Prime Minister directly, in person. I have appealed to the House Leader. Mr. Samuda, who, by the way, chaired the, co the committee of the House, Economy and Production Committee, when he, at the time when the government was, was in, was, this government was in opposition, and he chaired the committee, the very provisions in that bill was tabled by Mr. Samuda as chairman of the committee, mm -hmm. further to the motion that I tabled. He strenuously demanded that those be acted upon. And today... He flipped 180 degrees, and he's hugging up the very disgraceful acts that he was condemning. And Mr. Shaw, and Mr. Darrell Vaz, the record of Parliament can show you their signatures to the recommendations in that report. All I did was to take the recommendations and seek to codify them in a legislation so that they can become law to protect the ordinary Jamaican, so that when you go to the bank, with a one thousand dollar check, if you give, if I should give you a check for a thousand dollars, and you go to the bank, almost four hundred dollars is taken out of it. Yes. Though it is not the bank's account, it's coming from. It's my account. If you go to deposit monies in the bank, they charge you a fee, which is to allow them to make more money. Mm -hmm. They penalize you, <laughs> not rewarding you, yes. for enabling them to make more money. Yes. Those are the kinds of things you put your money in the bank for rainy day. Because we were taught from little children growing up, save for tomorrow. And I'm um, going to ask you to save that. And I just want to straighten the record. He did not write me a check for $1,000. He's here uh, for free. <laughs> but we'll be right back on Insight. Welcome back to Insight. We have the pleasure of having the chairman of the People's National Party and spokesman on national security, but you were here we're talking about finance as well. Um, there, to close off on that one, you had a situation about the dormant fees being charged. Yes, yes, and yes. And you promised some subsequent remind us of what that is. Yes, subsequent to my table in the bill to deal with the fees being deducted, which includes dormancy fees, I checked with the existing Banking Services Act which is of 2014, and there is a legal protection against charges like the dormancy fee. And it's for that reason I have put a legal team together who will be taking that matter to court to get a declaratory judgment on the charging of those fees, which will in effect declare that all deductions made for dormancy fees were illegally deducted and by extension the banks would be obliged to return it to their depositors. Yes. Um, so I'm pursuing that. There are two lawyers who are leading that matter. Um, they are now caught up in two very prominent cases, and they have asked me to give them a little time, yes. and they will dedicate their attention to it. So in the new year, we expect for that matter to be before the courts. Do you expect the matter of the debate on the billiard table to be before the financial year ends? I would take it on Tuesday. If the Prime Minister, the leader of the House, call a sitting tomorrow, the truth be told, this matter don't need any further debate. It has been fully debated. There's nothing new to say except that it has gotten worse since then to now. So all we have to do is to put the bill to the vote, pass the bill, and protect our people 
from losing monies, your hard-earned monies in their various accounts. Let me ask you this one. Um, one of your members, and one across the floor. Oh, by the way, before you go on, yes. you mentioned in the last segment about the fact that I didn't give you a check. <laughs> yes, it's a fact. You did not give me a check. I don't think you'll expect a check from a public servant like me. <laughs> so if you want to give me a check for my re-election, you know, I will say welcome it. Just Talk, keep it within the laws. Uh, talking about checks, um, the members of parliament sound as if they're like increasing the checks they get for their salaries. Um, one of your members as, um, with, a, with a surname Phillips and another one across uh, the aisle from you with a surname Campbell I've, I've mooted this, but here's, if my memory serves me right, and correct me, that the former um, Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellor, and um, Matalan, they came up with a scheme in terms of how things can be increased, yes? Um, a minister, for example, would be paid a dollar more That's than the permanent secretary. secretary. Why are we back here? The truth be told. Michael, uh, the matter has been politicized from time to time, and an incumbent government becomes reluctant to implement that scheme, even though it is, it is deemed to be rational, to be reasonable, to be sensible. And so it gets lagged behind over and over and over. Um, political representatives, I guess, across the world, Yes, that's I right. have a difficulty in granting increases to themselves when they are the ones who determine increases for other persons in the, in the, in the public service. So that is the challenge that it faces. When you look at across the rest of the region, for example, you know, we are way behind, but you know, the political will to do it does not exist. But what, what, I, what I find, um, as one who served in parliament for a long time as a reporter, um, when you, you understand the challenge that um, Peter don't like to pay Peter because they're afraid of what Paul might say. But at the end of the day, Good you're all in the same... Peter. John <laughs> John. There you go. Um, but at the end of the day, a formula has to be worked out. The, 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 the Parliament sought external um, assistance on that yes. and reasoning. And then we, the, 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 you know, the rubbish that's coming back again, and the, you know, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, Michael. But as I said before, it's really the absence of political will, even to attend to matters affecting yourself, where it is even more crucial. <laughs> some people won't believe that. I served in the Ministry of Finance for some period. There are some former members of Parliament and former ministers of government who couldn't even pay their medical bills when they leave office after many, many years. Because unlike many others in the public service, because you have to deal with thousands of persons at a constituency level, and for those of us who serve in national office, that number goes beyond your constituency. Mm -hmm. Because people know you, they can identify, to you, identify you. They feel comfortable to come to you in confidence of their hardships yes. and expect you to lend assistance to them. So many members, Many members have dipped into their personal resources, their own savings, and their own other earnings outside. Because some of us will have business yes, yes. enterprises that yes. we were in or going to, went into while in business as investment. They will tap into them to, to respond. You see, you see, I always say probably only the pastors and persons like these and some police officers too who work in communities alongside people. When you, in, when you meet up on some real hardships, it's hard to walk away if you have a dollar in your pocket or in your account, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, some of us try to do it very discreetly in terms of managing the demand that come to you. But once you are there and you see them, you know, on a daily basis, yes, yes, yes. And, and they don't walk with a flag in their, and in their hand to tell you that they have needs. When they feel comfortable enough to tell you and show you, yes. so that they're pulling a fast one yes, over you. scammers here. No yes. scamming, real hardships that they face. It's really hard. A colleague of mine said to me in my early days of coming to represent the politics, you know, when you go home after being in the constituency, is one of the most debilitating period. Because when you see the hardships that people, and you can't do anything about it, yes. you can't give a solution. Yes. 
and you go home and you sit down and have to consume all of that which is right before your eye. You're not reading about it in a newspaper. Thank you. I just hearing it in a news coverage. And we see some people that you have known for years and how their situation have deteriorated. Not just their physical situation, their economic situation. Yes. It hurts you. Yes. And you know, I tell you quite frankly, not unless you are there, you'll know what it's like. Yes. I made a comment oftentimes some of my former colleagues, those who have retired, yes. you know, I just don't run back. back. <laughs> when I see some of them one, two months after leaving office, they look ten years younger. <laughs> Unlike some of us, like this, said, that look beat up and, <laughs> and battered up. <laughs> up. And some of us that even gray, you lose here. Yes, yes. You know, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have four, three brothers, and, and I'm the last in my family. I am the least here. <laughs> All of them are full head of here. You know, you know. Let me, you know, go to one that sometimes you feel helpless about or issue of crime. Um, you have um, one of the things, the criticism comes that you're not treating it like a national event. You're, you're critical of the government. You're putting it so you're saying, look at how the crime rate gone up and uh, what have you. What's the solution to all let of me, this? Let me, let, me, let me start by making this abundantly clear. No opposition has the authority, the power to implement anything. You can only make suggestions, make recommendations. They are either accepted or they are not. So let us understand that. We don't have the opportunity nor the authority to do anything. That's one of the reasons why we seek to become government, so that we can implement the things that we believe ought to do. Now, we have had a crime challenge in Jamaica for a while. It didn't start with this government. It has just gotten worse with this government. Everybody re remembers very clearly the prime minister, then leader of the opposition, made a big proclamation. If you vote for them, you can keep your windows and doors open. Now you have to buy more grill. And if you keep your window open and your door open, it's to run from the criminals, yes. not to because you are secured. So for four years, and this is not an opinion of Fitz Jackson or the opposition, the police data confirms that after four years in office, there are more people being murdered on a year-to-year -year basis than was when the government took over. More people have been fatally, have been seriously um, shot, and I'm going to make an emphasis up to Saturday of this week. There were 71 more persons shot than last year. 71 more year to date. 22 more persons killed over this year, over last year up to Saturday, after two years of states of, states of emergency. Now, as I've said um, a couple of days ago, if you're doing something consistently and it's not giving you the result, something must be wrong with how you're doing what you're doing or what you're doing. But they're arguing that it's a, without the state of emergency, it would be worse. It wouldn't be 20 odd and 70 shot and it should be more. Uh, and is that, is that acceptable? When they instituted the state of emergency, it was to reduce the trend. It's just to turn it around. Now you have more people being killed, so you're not achieving the goal. Yes, it might be worse, but well, put it this way. But not put it this way. In the zones of special operation, you'll have a reduction. But they go elsewhere. You know the reason why? You reason why the murder rate don't go down? The criminals are killing because they are not being caught. The simple remedy to deal with murders and shootings is to identify those who are responsible, apprehend them, successfully prosecute them and lock them away. It is not a whole lot of people in Jamaica committing murders and shootings. It's a, it's a definable quantity. And the government is not effective in doing just that. Talk all the talk about strategy and all of that. At the end of the day, it is identifying the criminals, apprehending them. We have said, for example, Put more lawyers. Because one, when you look at the police stats, the clear up rate, how many persons have charged for a particular act? Less than 40%. That means 60% of the murders, they don't have nobody to, that they have charged are identified to charge. But of that 40 or 45%, what is the conviction rate? Less than probably 6%. 
Why is it that the cases fall apart? Look at the quality of the preparation of the case going to court. And the opposition have said from over two years ago, send a signal to the criminals that once we hold you, you are going to be found guilty because we have the evidence, we have a strong case to lock you away and you will not be able to commit murders. It is as simple as that. Is that being done? No. Is that, would, is that something that the opposition would change? I am giving that undertaking on the opposition that that would be my number one priority. We have said, don't wait until we come into office. Put lawyers to work with the police. Lawyers know about preparing cases for a successful prosecution in court. Strengthen the police capacity to put cases together. I and the lawyers spend the money there. Yes. They have not done it. But we have said it. Yes. Help we me. Have, we, have, we went further. The state of emergency. The people in the state of emergency areas, they welcome the presence of the security forces. I've been to St. James. I've been to West Milan. I've been to Hanover, throughout Clarendon, in St. Catherine, where my constituency is. They said, look, we want security. We want the presence of the security. We do not want the restrictions that you put on all of us innocent people. What they have said to me, tell the government to be more, um, um, be more spear fishing. Go to the criminals. Don't come to all of us and let us, our lives become miserable. The business people complain because they have lost revenue. Revenue is lost. They have to lay off people. More economic challenge to their employers and their employees and their families. The inconvenience it, it, it places on the residents in those areas to go about their normal um, lives. Even churches cannot worship too late. But let me ask you this one. Should tomorrow uh, Fitz Jackson be appointed the Minister of National Security, what would he do about the states of emergency as they exist now? Because that is a policy position, not a, not the, the commissioner of police has been saying that he wants SOEs. Wouldn't there be a problem well, in terms of what well, you well, want as a policy? The, it is the political directorate that ultimately takes the decision, not the chief of the security forces, the chief of defense staff, nor the commissioner of police. They may make recommendations for which the prime minister may or may not act upon. We have said that the state of emergency must be used for what it was designed for, emergencies. Right? And there's a provision in the Constitution for that. So it will remain there. Will we use it as a crime-fighting tool? No. What have we said that we will do in, as an alternative to states of emergency? Currently on the books, the police can have cordon and search. Don't need any declaration in Parliament. You can have those operations for extended period as the circumstances dictate. We have said to the, to, the, to, the, to the Prime Minister, why don't you look at putting static security presence in your hotspot areas throughout the country where they have the eye crime? Because the people want the security presence there. Put them there. You don't have to go to Parliament to get any support for that. The current law permits you to do that. So you send the signal to the residents in the community. We are here. We, the security forces, are here to protect you. You satisfy that assurance that they want. We say to the government, um, improve on your presence by adequate or even more adequate police mot uh, motor vehicle, bikes, cars, so that police can respond to transport in general. Transport in general. Yes. So that when people call in distress, they don't hear that there's no police, there's no cars here, we can't respond to you. So you don't hide the fear amongst peop among people. When people tell us a criminal is here in their community, you can respond to it. You don't need a state of emergency to do those things. We are convinced in the opposition, Michael, that the Prime Minister, having failed miserably after two years, for example, don't forget, you know, the first thing they do when they came into office, is to set up some people to import over $427 million worth of used cars. Mm -hmm. First country in the world. Mm -hmm. there is, we have a big, biggest problem in crime. And you do what no other country in the world attempt to do. Use the least able cars to fight crime. Yes. Luckily, after much pressure and support of the broad stakeholder groups, they have abandoned that ill-conceived policy 
and have begun to use proper new vehicles. So that is just one element of it. Another one that we say, look, what is your intelligence gathering capabilities are? Because mm -hmm. I mentioned before, you have to be able to can identify the criminals. You need intelligence. So you can convert that intelligence into, into um, evidence yes, yes, yes. that you can have successful uh, prosecution. What is the state of the capacity? What is the state of the capacity of the JCF to do that? So as the next Minister of National Security, I would give my security head within a 30-day period to report back to me a, 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 an assessment of the current state, what we need to get it to where I want it to be, to enable them to be effective and successful in the field, and whatever the money is, if I'm going to be called rogue again, <laughs> to find the funds to enable us to have an, an intelligence gathering capability that we can identify the criminals, then I am planning to be a rogue in that regard. And here we go, and we're not going rogue, we're just going for another break, and when you come back, we want to find out who is Fitz Jackson. We'll be right back on it. Welcome back to Insight. We're on to the um, states of emergency, um, zones of special operations, and according to a friend of mine um, who works on RJR, and, um, zones of civil operations. <laughs> the doctor knows who he is. Um, you, yet you speak that you would not use them as you do should you go get into office and become... Or when we get into office. office. When you get in, there you go. Um, but yet you vote. Yes. Yet you vote. It's a very precarious position. I've set out to you a few moments ago what we would do as an alternative. And I made a point earlier on. We're not government. You have one government at a time. So we can't do what we would like to do. And what the country has been faced with, and the, every single Jamaica has been faced with on a daily basis, is this threat of crime and violence. Because the government has offered no other alternative what is placed before the opposition? Do you allow something or nothing? Because we can't implement an alternative that we have put forward, as I discussed with you a moment ago. So should we, by the power we have of the vote in Parliament, allow the country to be totally exposed rather than just having an ineffective policy approach? We have opted... Lesser the evils. Lesser of the evil. It is not a comfortable decision that we, uh, that we are called upon to make. But we nonetheless have that responsibility to the people of Jamaica. So we have asked, even our own PNP supporters, you don't support state of emergency as a crime fighting method. Right? And some will say, what are you going to do? Well, we can't do anything when we're not in government. That's yeah. why we seek to be in government. So why are we in opposition? Why do you vote for it? Should we leave the people more exposed. We don't say that there's no result. We say it is marginal and it is not sufficiently effective to deal with the problem across the country, as we see in the numbers. Yes. One of the things that we have noted over the years is the developing of special squads that takes on a situation, hopefully cauterize and then moves on. Uh, why not go the route of special squads that deals with specific issues, that snake in the bed as opposed to one in the garden on the outside that's coming at you, to cauterize the bloodletting? This weekend was just like crazy. Terrible. There were nine persons in, in, in less than 40 okay. hours. Yes. yes. Michael, every country in the world, their security forces have special units to deal with special situations, not across the board every day, to deal with special situations. So yes, the police force must have a special ops unit to deal with circumstances like those. But we are talking about policing, routine policing, throughout the various communities in Jamaica. And therefore, you need a strategy that can deal with that in an overarching way. 
And I said that one of, the, one of the immediate suggestions we make is those, those static posts, you know, you can rotate the members so they don't get static mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. Okay. The post is static, but not the members. Because you can rotate them across. Right? And I want to make this point. One of the failures we have had over the years for a long time, we tried it in our last time in office in the 2012-2016 period to pursue social intervention in selected areas. You are not going to deal with the, the issue of crime and violence in any sustainable way unless you deal with the causes and the sources of the criminal recruits throughout the various communities across the country. We have, we have enough and more than enough social science research that give you the profile of the persons, the profile of the communities, where the supply of young members come from, what lead them towards it. We have not made sufficient investment in that. And so the next PNP administration is going to take a two-pronged approach to dealing with crime. The immediate suppression of the crime, containment of it, while simultaneously, not consecutively, but simultaneously identify, use the research data, and to recruit a team and an army of social workers that can go into those communities on a sustainable basis. Look at the Peace Management Initiative Program, which by all accounts is very effective. The government is causing it to collapse at the end of this year. They need $6 million to complete the calendar, the financial year. Those violence interrupters go and, as, as they are described, interrupt violence, save lives, develop peace and harmony among warring factions in communities, help them develop the capacity to resolve disputes without resorting to violence. The government, led by Mr. Holness, is causing PMI uh, violence interrupters program to collapse. Why? Why they, they need $6 million roughly to complete the calendar year. It is over up to $40 million is spent on an SOE in each area, in one SOE. And the results are there. Where is the priority of this government? Just a showcase, song and dance thing to say, we are in charge, we have state of emergency. They, make, they, they sing all these songs, but at the end of the day, don't listen to what I say. Look at the police stats and you see the result for what they are singing and dancing uh, about. And at the end of the day, it is... It is not just the persons who are murdered and who are shot at. It's the thousands of Jamaicans who live in daily fear. Break-ins have increased. Robberies have increased. Women in particular go about the city and this and other cities throughout Jamaica in fear virtually every day that they get up. That is what this government has allowed this country to degenerate into because of their failure. That's part of the reason why we believe that there is an emergency to all this government and its failure. Okay, so, so we can restore some amount of safety, a sense of safety for the ordinary Jamaican. Let's try your profile now. Who is Fitz Jackson? Fitz Jackson, born and raised in Lloydersville, St. Catherine, mm -hmm. from working parents, were business people. Um, I, I can say I was quite fortunate to grow up in a community where I know what love is and I know what caring is. Because in Lloydersville, I was not only a child of my parents, I was a child of the entire village. Mm -hmm. And that experience has guided my entire life. And so all my life, without any deliberate decision, I found myself involved in community work everywhere in the world that I have lived. I studied in the United States. You studied what, sir? Well, my first area, I went to Kingston Technical High School. Okay. Just across down the road from there, I did civil engineering uh, building. I left there and went to Milwaukee Area Technical College, where my brother was residing, gave me an offer helping with his business while I could yes. go to school, did an States. associate degree, and a second associate degree there. Transferred then to University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee campus continuing doing engineering. I decided I'm not going to work as an engineer for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I changed to the social sciences and did a political science degree and then came back home immediately after completing studies 
worked in the public service for six months um, mm -hmm. as an administrator. And then I felt the, the bite again to go back to school. So I went back to the United States in Florida, did an MPA program in public administration. Yeah. Came back to Jamaica immediately after. By this time, I had a family in yeah. the making. Yeah. I have a st had a stepdaughter, daughter of my, my, my um, ex-wife. And we had two wonderful sons um, who I'm very, very proud of. And I've spent a good, you know, my marriage never lasts that long. And I became a single parent. Yes. <laughs> when I separated, my sons opted to be with me. So I, I had the experience of being a single parent. And they have, they have, one have gone on to become an attorney at law and the other in investment banking. <laughs> <There you right? laughs> and um, one has started his own family now. And I'm very, very, very proud of my children. Yes. And I, I how, how did you join this? this why, why it wasn't a labor ride? Why, why a comrade? Was your well, parents I, told, I told you about my experience of not living for myself, yes. but living for others. I grew up in that, and I lived it. And I see I have an obligation to help others and to serve my country. And um, the People's National Party, of course, provides a vehicle. It was hereditary? It wasn't a re My father was a parish councillor, I must say, in the the National Party. He was representing the People's okay. National Party. It was not because he was a comrade from yeah. then. But I learned to, I grew up to appreciate and know more about the People's National Party. It's philosophical on opinion. Mm -hmm. And I tell people all the time, you know, I don't serve the party. I serve the goals of the party. All right. So I want to thank you so much. My Alas, pleasure. this is the time we have. We could do so much more, but then again, there are other occasions that we can. Until then, Michael Sharp wishing you pleasant viewing.